All right, we are recording. We are live on the internet. Hopefully, I didn't just kick someone out on accident. Uh, all right, any questions before we get started? We don't have a chance to look at anything yet. Probably not. You guys have a test tomorrow morning, I imagine. You're probably all studying for that. And then you'll deal with forms. I got a whole three days to deal with that. Okay, I understand. Um, I had a good case uh, that came up while I was working on Monday that is very pertinent to our uh, discussions of pain management. So basically, I had a, uh, you know, I was working in Central, and so we're handling all the orders that are coming through, and we have a lot of uh, post-op orders that come through, you know, so uh, what type of medications do you think people get prescribed in the post-operative setting? A lot of pain meds, right? So you get a lot of uh, PACU orders. Uh, anyone know what the PACU stands for? So, yeah, it's like recovery, but it's like post-anesthesia care units. That's basically where they go, where they recover after they've had, you know, undergone general anesthesia, and then they will go to wherever they're going to go, whether they get discharged or they go to the floor or wherever they happen to go to. But that's usually in uh, the area kind of where they're recovering and they're getting some pain medication in the kind of the, the acute post-op setting. It's a lot of pain meds. Um, so one of the things that we saw come through, or we have, uh, sometimes we'll start up a PCA in the PACU. Is there me in my room is pretty good. Um, <laughs> so, um, so anyways, we had a PCA. Remember, PCA stands for patient controlled analgesia, right? You may want to look at this stuff prior to my favorite game. I play that every day. Um, anywho. So we had a PCA order come through, and so if you guys remember, we covered PCA. So what are kind of the different components that you have for a PCA order? Yeah, so you have a basal rate and a bolus rate. Those are two really big components there. So the basal rate is usually what? How would you describe it? Yeah, basal rate. If you had to describe a basal rate. Mm -hmm. Yep, so that's what kind of what they're getting continuously, right? So, uh, so for instance, in this case, so let me pull up like a sticky note. Okay, so for instance, in this case, hopefully you guys can see this. This will, this will come up on the recording. Um, but let's say we have a morphine PCA comes through, and then you'll get the basal rate, which in this case I wrote for, and this is one of the uh, anesthesiologists who uh, also works in the pain service. Um, so you see one milligram per hour. Okay, that makes sense. That's a, that's a decent dose, you know, for, and it's like a 17-year-old uh, female patient. I don't know what surgery she was getting specifically, but uh, anyway, so then the next uh, thing we said, there's a basal rate, and then there's what else? There's a bolus dose. There's a bolus dose, okay. And so usually what you would see is that for the bolus dose, you would have half of your hourly rate <laughs> per dose. So in this case, what would it be? Half milligrams, you get 0 0.5 milligrams, and then we'll talk about uh, the, the uh, how frequent they can get that. But in this case, you would think 0 0.5 milligrams would seem pretty reasonable. And again, this was uh, so far was appropriate based on our weight. Uh, what came through was a four milligram per dose bolus dose. That's four times what their basal rate was, which is automatically starting to kind of send off some some red flags. Now, when you think of IV morphine for like an adult sort of patient, what dose do you think of? Four, four milligrams is pretty good. Usually like two to five milligrams is usually pretty good. So she's getting a full size dose right there with every bolus. And that's going to be what she's actually hitting the button for. And then she would get that. So then the next component is, is the question is how often is she going to get that? And so, so what we have is it's called a lockout interval. In this case, it was 10 minutes. You may see like six minutes, 10 minutes, usually some kind of uh, 15 minutes, some, usually some, some sort of increment, usually kind of uh, it fits into an hour pretty well. So this means that she could give herself every 10 minutes a four milligram dose of morphine in addition to the one milligram per hour that she was getting. Okay. Kind of a lot. But then the, the next uh, the kind of the final component you would see is that you will have a four hour max. And usually you would just take your basal rate per hour times that by four and then add up every single um, PRN dose that she can give herself and that would be your total max, which in this case would be like 90 something milligrams, which is an absurd amount. Um, but the, the doc had just wrote for 30 milligrams. So I was like, all right, this is kind of odd. You know, it's a really, really big uh, kind of bolus dose that the patient's giving themselves pretty, pretty frequently. 
So, okay, so that's just a question. The other thing that was really odd about this, and again, this is the patient controlling all of their analgesia at this point. Um, should you have outside orders of this for an additional opioids? Not typically. What should you do instead? You adjust the PCA, right? So, again, if the patient's having to hit the button every single – and you can, you can monitor for this. You can look on the pump, and it'll tell you how often they're hitting the button. If they're hitting it every five minutes, you can figure out kind of uh, – you can adjust your basal rates. That way they're getting more, so their kind of basal pain's under control. And then you can adjust things like the bolus dose as well. So that's usually what you do. But in this case, the doc had also written for a morphine, PRN, uh, 5 mil – I'm sorry. Let me write this better. Uh, 5 milligrams IV – uh, Q2 hours, PRN, 10 out of 10 pain. This is the other big red flag that came up because, again, now the question is, okay, so the patient's given themselves all these doses of morphine. Who makes the decision on whether or not they get this additional order? The nurse makes the decision, right? So they basically what you could have is a situation where the patient's getting the basal rate. They give themselves a dose of, of the morphine of 4 milligrams. The nurse comes by and says, hey, how's your pain? She goes, oh, it's 10 out of 10. The nurse says, okay, well, I'll go ahead and give you five milligrams. And then by the time that next 10 minutes is up, guess what? She can give herself another four milligrams. Quite a bit. So, again, I was very hesitant about processing these orders. So I said, well, let me call the provider and kind of figure out what's going on. So I called the guy up, very nice guy, and he was like, well, you know, if you look in the, the, in the PACU, the MAR, which anyone know what a MAR stands for? It's a medication administration record. That's where you can see all the meds that have been given. This is where the nurses are documenting how much and what they're giving and what time and all that. So very important things to look at. So he said, well, if you look at the MAR, you'll actually see the patient got one milligram of Dilaudid, which we know that is Dilaudid more or less potent than morphine. It's a lot more, pot uh, more potent, used about six times more potent. He got a milligram of uh, Dilaudid and then had gotten 18 milligrams of morphine. So quite a bit, right? Um, so... This is not completely out of the realm of possibility, especially for patients who have chronic pain issues. Because we said with, with long-term pain control with opioids, what happens? You, yeah, you develop tolerance, right? So you need bigger and bigger doses in order to get the same effects out of that. So this is obviously a patient who had pretty significant um, pain medication tolerance already built up, uh, maybe low threshold for pain. And so she'd already received quite a bit, a bit of medication. So he said, well, my goal is if because that four-hour max doesn't actually equal up to every single dose she could give herself, she would lock herself out pretty quickly with that four-hour max. You know, so she can give her – basically, he's trying to get her over the hump initially in the post-operative period. And then if she's really still having 10 out of 10 pain, she can, you know, the nurse can come by and still give her that additional dose of morphine. So I said, okay, well, I'm not totally convinced, but you're the pain management specialist. You know, you're the anesthesiologist. If you feel comfortable, you could explain it to me. You know, we had a dialogue. I said, okay, we'll go ahead and put it through. So I went ahead and documented everything. Um, you know, usually you document your conversation because if you don't document things, then, yeah, it didn't happen, right? You can't ever prove that it existed. Um, and so went ahead and put it through. Uh, and then the one of my colleagues I was working with um, that day, he actually texted me the following day, and he said, oh, yeah, by the way, that patient got some Narcan last night, uh, showing that she had obviously gotten a little too much, and then had some respiratory or significantly enough CNS depression uh, that she needed to have some reversal with that with naloxone. So be very careful because, again, you may get very tolerant to the pain, uh, you know, the analgesic uh, aspects of opioids. However, that respiratory depression is still always going to be a risk, especially when you have these kind of frequent dose stacking that's happening here, right? So be very careful with these. Make sure that, you know, things are, uh, you know, we have dosing guidelines that we will show up in these orders. Make sure you kind of follow those. Uh, and they'll try to, try to keep you out of trouble as best you can. Any questions about that? Yes, sir. So what would be some options for that? So any opioid is going to have respiratory depression as a risk, right? So even thing, even kind of wimpy opioids like tramadol can still have a risk if you get a big enough dose. So you could use fentanyl. You'd use a smaller dose. You'd be dosing like in micrograms, which we've done fentanyl PCAs before. That's certainly not unheard of. Um, however, it's just a matter of uh, scaling back the dose, and that, that risk is still there for that patient. What are some other things we could have done maybe to, to limit how many opioids she's having to get? What else could you have on her profile, potentially? We could do things like NSAIDs, potentially, you know, depending on surgery and depending on her bleeding risk, that may be potentially uh, feasible. So we could do things like IV uh, Ketorolac or, or Toradol might be a good option that can limit how much you need there. Having some acetaminophen on her profile as well could also help. You know, so sometimes we'll get IV acetaminophen. Um, you know, say for 24 hours uh, on a Q6 PRN basis for pain, you know, so sometimes they'll, they'll do these things to try to limit how many of the opioids they're getting. Now, if it was a specific, like say, like an orthopedic surgery, what could we do uh, specifically with pain in just that area? 
yeah, you could do nerve blocks. You could do local blocks or using like a, um, a local anesthetic, something like a lidocaine or bupivacaine or ropivacaine. We'll cover those more in the surgery section, but these are options that you could do um, to limit how much of those opioids you're having to administer and, and hopefully not having uh, issues with this. That's why the other big component to make sure you, when you have orders like this where the patient's administering it themselves, you need to have a PRN naloxone order on board as well, which this patient did. Um, so the nurse can act on that uh, you know, immediately if they notice that, you know, hey, the patient's totally zonked out or hey, they're breathing you know, four times a minute, we should probably reverse that, right? So th these are things that the nurse could respond to because the order was already on the profile, right? She didn't have to like call a code and have someone show up and then and administer it. So any other questions about that? I thought it was kind of an interesting case. So just be very careful with these. Um, doesn't matter how high of a pain tolerance or pain medication tolerance a, a patient has, they can still have that respiratory depression still be pretty dangerous. Okay, if only 53 people signed up, sorry, was I covering that up? Someone should have yelled at me. Are these all the people who are going to participate? Oh, boy. <laughs> Anyone else? Wow, low turnout. Looks like everyone's here today. <laughs> 57 is good. Okay, we well can sign up uh, as we go. The, the pen will still be there if you need to. So anyway, let's get started with our Kahoot review. I decided to uh, I ditch the video game questions Instead, we're going to focus on heavy metal. <laughs> Which of the following bands had a one-armed drummer? This is a picture. Hmm. Hmm. It's a lot of like 70s, 80s, 90s metal. Maybe pour some sugar on me. Nothing know. I randomized the order, so I didn't expect the joke one to come up first, but it's okay. Or the, the trivia one. Wow, I'm surprised most of you guys actually knew that. Yes, that was Def Leppard. I don't know the guy's name off the top of my head. Uh, perhaps some of you guys know, but yes. And uh, the, the joke I always heard growing up was, what well, has 11 arms and sucks? Def Leppard. <laughs> I thought they were okay. They had a few good. And say it was the best joke. But anyway, all right, uh, continuing on. Let's see. No points for that one. Sorry, guys. Okay, colchicine, colchris, would be best suited for patients with osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, gouty arthritis, osteoporosis. What would be a good option for this? And we know what plant that is? That's the colchicine plant. Okay, there's another name for it. That's where we get colchicine from. Actually, the autumn crocus. So if you've ever seen autumn crocus, don't go eat it because you'll get colchicine poisoning. You know good. Perfect, yes. We are going to use this for gouty arthritis, yes. So, again, remember how colchicine works? How does that drug work? It's an antimitotic drug, right? So it kind of helps to limit a lot of that uh, you know, white cell you know, uh, migration to sites of inflammation, try to help to, to mitigate a lot of the inflammation that happens there. So could I use this for, say, prevention of a gouty flare-up? No. no, we only are going to use this for acute exacerbation, right? So what else could I use for a patient having acute gout exacerbation? NSAIDs are good, right? Some use NSAIDs. Alpurinol, not going to be for an acute attack. This is going to be more for uh, urate-lowering therapy, right? So we're going to be using that for kind of chronic maintenance, right? Potentially steroids. You can even do like an intra-articular steroid. Uh, for, uh, wouldn't be our first-line choice, but that could be an option potentially. What did you say? What did say again? Oh, prevenicid. <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's also going to be urate lowering therapy. So that actually could be actually uh, because you can actually end up seeing uh, an acute uh, uh, short term rise in uric acid levels with that drug. Uh, interestingly enough, so actually that that one you could actually induce a gouty attack. It'd be careful with that one. So that would not be one. I think NSAIDs, think um, you know uh, anti inflammatories, glucocorticoids potentially could be utilized here. Um, even sometimes opioids could be utilized for this if nothing else is really working for them, right? So you have all these kind of pain management options. Just know what's good for chronic maintenance. Know what's going to be better for uh, a kind of acute attack, right? So you're at lowering therapy like allopurinol, which works how inhibits. Yeah, so it's antioxidase inhibitors, how that's going to be working. So it's going to be blocking the actual production of uric acid. Um, so that's going to be good for kind of long-term control to drop those levels down to hopefully prevent uh, that from happening. Okay, good. Do, do, do. Let's see. <laughs> Go easy. Sorry, the test is already written. It's already been set in stone. Oh, boy. 
Okay. Uh, which of the following is not a common effect seen with hydromorphone or dilated overdose? Which is one of these things you would not expect to see. So perhaps which of these things this, that patient I was just talking about did not exhibit, also having a uh, opioid misadventure. Perfect. It's hypertension we would not expect to see. So remember, when you have those new receptors being activated, um, you will see meiosis being a potential thing there. It's not going to show up with every single you know, overdose or someone who's having, have, having opioids on board, um, but it's one of those things they classically describe. So kind of the triad of symptoms there is meiosis. You're also going to see respiratory depression, and you also see lethargy associated with you know, CNS depression. Um, so those are the three big things you'd expect to see. Hypertension is actually not one of them. If anything, uh, with something like morphine, due to release of uh, substances like histamine, you may actually see hypotension. But that's really more of a kind of a morphine coding kind of thing. Uh, with the hydromorphone, you would not expect to see hypertension. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. In the movie, this is Spinal Tap. What is the max volume the amps go up to? Another metal question. <laughs> I don't know why all the joke ones are coming up early, but it's okay. It's true. They go up to 11. I said, why don't you just make 10 a little bit louder? Can't do that. They go up to 11. All right. So, yeah, so 11 was the correct answer. They had all their amps with the actual 11 on there. It's very funny. You can Google that scene. All right. Another one. Okay, which guitarist played the solo on the Michael Jackson song, Beat It? Hmm. Which band did Slash belong to? Guns and Roses. Guns and Roses, yep. How about Dimebag Daryl? Pantera. Pantera, yep. How about Eddie Van Halen? Van Halen, yes. Okay, perfect. Yes. Randy Rhodes? Anyone know him? Played with Ozzy Osbourne for, for a period of time there. Yeah. Yes, Eddie Van Halen was actually the uh, the guitarist on, he did the solo on Beat It. So, interesting crossover there. I tell you guys are super excited about all this metal trivia. Yeah. Okay, how about this one? Let's get back to the drugs. Which of these would be most likely to cause weight gain? Liraglutide, metformin, citagliptin, glipizine. What are you most likely to see weight gain from? By the way, I told my wife about the uh, the crickets, and she felt vindicated. <laughs> She's like, finally, someone else agrees. I have to listen to this stuff all the time. Share the video. Yeah. She's like, I'm not going to watch that. No. I have to hear you talk at home all the time. I'm not going to listen to that. Interesting. Got a little split here. Okay, so remember, um, that how is glipizide working? Remember, it's stimulating the pancreas to release insulin, right? So again, we're utilizing our own actual functioning pancreas to try to increase insulin release. We know insulin does what to weight? Increases it, right? Because we're storing all those extra amino acids and glucose and all that good stuff into the cells. That tends to have an anabolic effect. You tend to put on weight when someone gets switched over to insulin, which again is a problem for some of these patients who are type 2 diabetes because they're probably already obese to begin with, or some, some subset of them will be. So uh, again, that's one thing to watch out for. Again, this can be overcome with dietary modifications, you know, physical activity, things like that. But that is a certainly a, a known risk uh, of glipizide and other sulfonylureas, right? That's kind of the overarching category there. Uh, metformin, what does that do to weight? It, it usually stays either the same or it might have a little bit of mild decrease, right? So you really shouldn't see any big changes there. Uh, how about citagliptin? That's one of those DPP-4 inhibitors, help to prevent breakdown of GLP-1. 
actually probably see kind of neutral effects. You won't really see a lot of weight loss associated with that one. However, if by giving an incretin mimetic, by giving a GLP-1 agonist like liraglutide, you do see some pretty significant weight loss associated with that one, right? So again, um, sometimes being used off-label for that in some cases, uh, but you do see some good some good benefits on weight from, from that standpoint, right? So again, good to know based on if your patients are obese to begin with, like which medications might be better for them from that standpoint, right? <coughs> Right. Mesalamine enemas, or WASA, would be most likely to benefit which patients? Constipated patients, Crohn's disease patients, ulcerative colitis patients, GERD patients. What do we use mesalamine for? Final answers. What do we think? Interesting. Okay. So, you, so, so what? So, people who get constipated, what tripped you up? Was the enema? Could have been the enema. Yeah, it could have been the thing that kind of tripped you up there, right? So, again, not all enemas are meant specifically to help constipated patients. Um, certainly, what could we use as an enema for a constipated patient? Flea enema, which has what in it? Right, those are the, that sodium phosphate containing enemas, right? So if you ever see like a, um, a fleet phosphosoda, that's usually what they're referring to is the, is the sodium phosphate containing enemas. Um, who, who could that be dangerous in? Hmm? Uh, yeah, potentially renal patients already holding on to too much phosphorus. Not hypotensive necessarily. No, nah, pregnant patients. So the really old and the really young are the two big ones that are going to uh, be, uh, you have to be really careful with that because you can cause pretty significant hyperphosphatemia and cause some big issues. And this is more like with repeated dosing, but certainly, um, you know, older patients have renal dysfunction. That's a big problem. Kids are going to just have a lot bigger shifts in their electrolytes because, they're, again, they're smaller and you're getting a big dose uh, right there. All, the, all those phosphates can be absorbed pretty easily. So, um, but anyway, mesalamine. Uh, the enema itself, specifically, we use for ulcerative colitis patients. Why do we not use it for Crohn's disease patients? Right, Crohn's is going to be more kind of diffuse. It's going to be kind of more throughout the GI tract as opposed to ulcerative colitis, more likely being, you know, uh, especially for the enema specifically, it was better for a left-sided colitis or just a proctitis. That's going to be the better place for that drug to work. But you're more likely to see a benefit ulcerative colitis patients. Now, certainly, I could give... Um, other mesalamine like products orally, and then at that point, could it work for Crohn's disease? Yes. Absolutely, right. So it could definitely work for those patients at that point. So again, think about the dosage form, think about what is going to be appropriate based on your patient's you know, disease state. Okay. All right. Which medication blocks sodium channels to prevent neuronal transmission of pain signals? What do we think? Buprenorphine, naloxone, lidocaine, capsaicin. You guys should know this based on your arrhythmia lectures from last semester. Right? There's no way you would have forgotten any of that stuff because cardiac stuff is very important. The one person just hovering over the. Like, I'm to pick. <laughs> this one or that one? This one or that one? All right, yes. Lidocaine would be the correct answer in this case, right? So we were talking about those local anesthetics being nice because they're opioid sparing. Um, again, very specifically, those are working locally to block those sodium channels, right? You prevent the action potential propagation, you prevent that pain signal from ever being sent up into the CNS, right? So that's why you get that numbness, uh, the anesthesia that actually occurs in that local site. Uh, buprenorphine, how, uh, which kind of drug is that? 
that's going to be a partial mu agonist, right? So that's going to be better for patients um, who are trying to, say, get off of an opioid addiction, right? That would be a better option for them. Um, not blocking sodium channels, though, right? How about naloxone? It's going to be an antagonist at the mu receptors, right? So that reverses uh, an opioid effect. So that would not be uh, correct in this case. And then remember uh, how capsaicin works? Deplete substance P in those nerves, right? So basically you kind of prevent uh, that, that kind of pain sensitizing substance P uh, from being uh, available. And again, remember all the kind of caveats that go along with using capsaicin needs to be very consistent. You got to make sure you're washing your hands, like all the kind of good education points. Lidocaine's the only one. So again, going back to the arrhythmia thing, what do you think happens if someone were to accidentally get, say, too much uh, lidocaine ad administered and you get all the systemic absorption of it? Arrhythmia. Arrhythmia is absolutely so. Um, it's actually one of the big problems you run into. There's another uh, local anesthetic we use called bupivacaine. Bupivacaine you'll see used a lot for kind of regional blocks and things like that, especially if like an orthopedic patient. And um, that one, we actually have to have orders of a drug called intralipid. Have you ever talked about intralipid before? Basically, when you give someone uh, IV nutrition, you need to cover three big things, right? So what are the three big nutritional components you cover? Well, uh, yes, you need electrolytes as well, but from a nutrition, I guess from macronutrients. You need protein, fats, you need carbohydrates, right? So those are the three big macronutrients you're going to need. Um, so to provide the fats, we have a product called Intralip. It looks like a ba uh, bag of milk, essentially. But again, it's all, uh, it's all basically lipids uh, when you administer that. So it's actually kind of cool with bupivacaine. If you were to have toxicity, which it basically, you know, if someone were to get IV bupivacaine on accident, it would basically just stop the heart entirely because it blocks all those sodium channels. You could not have a depolarization. It's very um, uh, pronounced, uh, very quick acting sort of uh, cardiodepressant. What we can do is we actually have standing orders for patients who are on uh, bupivacaine infusions and things into a local site for intralipid. So that way uh, we can give them uh, 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 give them this fat very quickly into the veins. And bupivacaine itself is very fat soluble. So what it actually will do is it'll partition off of the heart and go into this new fat layer that's in the blood, and then it can be eliminated. So if you ever see like intralipid being given, or if you see it on a profile for someone getting like a local anesthetic, that's what it's for. It'd help reverse that in case there was ever like a, a cardiac toxicity from that. Anyway, a little tangent there. But again, lidocaine patches are used pretty frequently. So you can, uh, transdermal use is, is done uh, frequently, especially for what types of pain do you think? You, uh, yeah, for chronic, but neuropathic pain uh, primarily. So you see a lot of uh, uh, lidoderm patches being used for things like that. So, all right. TB is still winning. We gotta, we gotta eradicate that, right? What are we gonna use to eradicate TB? Isoniazid, rifampin. Some starts with an E. <laughs> More specifically, ethambutol. Something that starts with a P. Pyrazinamide, yep. Hmm? The red green uh, color discrimination. There's just little bits of light back there that you're like, oh, I see. It's okay. This is why I don't expect you to remember everything I tell you. But to at least be able to look things up, so you'll be like, oh, I remember something about that. Let me go look that up, and then it will come, kind of come flooding back to you, right? The joke, so you should remember all of those, because <laughs> never know when you need to cheer yourself up. <laughs> okay, uh, which of the following conditions would be improved by starting a patient on transdermal testosterone? Conditions would be improved by giving someone transdermal testosterone. Not touchdown testosterone, but transdermal. think what do we think oh. interesting gynecomastia can actually worsen uh be worsened by uh testosterone why is that <laughs> hmm? negative feedback, negative feedback? Hmm. gets turned into estrogen you remember the enzyme that does that aromatase right again providing extra testosterone will actually convert uh some a bit of that we converted by aromatase into estrogen and then boom you have your gynecomastia effect right 
It's not because their pecs are getting so big and they can bench like 400 pounds. It's not really gonna come nasty, right? Um, however, osteoporosis actually can be benefited by giving uh, testosterone. So again, estrogen and testosterone have positive effects on the bone to help kind of uh, prevent resorption, uh, decrease osteoclast activity. So that can be beneficial, especially in older patients. Um, congestive heart failure, would that be benefited? Not really. Um, can't really. That's kind of a red herring sort of answer there. Um, and then BPH, that would be worse, and absolutely. So the, uh, especially when it gets uh, testosterone gets converted into DHT via the, uh, that 5-alpha reductase enzyme, that's actually going to be much more potent at helping to cause hyperplasia of the uh, the prostate. And we'll talk more about that in the urology section coming up later on in the, in the class. All right. Then they got tricky guys with that one. That's pretty good. A little proud of myself for that one. I'm just kidding. Okay, uh, which agent would allow for the fastest healing of a gastric ulcer? Magnesium hydroxide, sucralfate, cimetidine, lansoprazole. The fastest healing of a gastric ulcer. All right, good job. Yes, uh, lansoprazole. So again, lansoprazole being what type of drug? PPI, proton pump inhibitor. Those are going to be the most potent at decreasing gastric acid production, right? So those are going to allow for the most suppression. You're going to have the most, uh, the best ability for those ulcers to start to heal. So remember, if we looked at those treatment times, you'd see that you know you can get with between like two and four weeks for PPI versus maybe like four to eight weeks for something like uh, an H2 blocker. Which which one of these are the H2 blocker? Okay, so metanine is H2 blocker up there. We don't use because 3A4 inhibition, absolutely. What does uh, sucralfate do? It codes to some. It can, it can be a helpful adjunctive agent in addition to a PPI. However, um, the, the effects are more short-lived, uh, short right? You can give a PPI one time a day um, because, again, it's going to be one of those kind of irreversible inhibitors of the proton pump. However, paraphate has to be given, you know, say three, four times a day because once that kind of gets washed away through the GI tract, it's kind of gone at that point. So it's not going to work when it's not there. How about uh, mag hydroxide? Yeah. That makes you have diarrhea. It does make you have diarrhea. That's a good point. But the other thing is? an antacid, right? So once it gets neutralized, it's done, it's done its work, right? So again, it's going to be very short-lived effect. That's why uh, things like, you know, uh, Tums and sodium bicarb and things like that are better for kind of acute issues of, of you know, uh, acid overproduction or, or uh, acute symptoms of GERD, things like that. Um, those are better for acute things. PPIs, H2 blockers are better for more kind of long-term chronic issues. But PPIs have the best ability to heal in the shortest time possible. Now, they're equally efficacious uh, between the H2 blockers and the PPIs. It's just a matter of time. Usually, if we can heal it faster, it's going to be better for our patients overall. All right. What is the name of Iron Maiden's mascot? It's this gentleman right here, not, not the devil. His name Judas, Ozzy, Lemmy, Eddie. What is his name? Useless trivia, you never thought you'd ever learn, but now it'll be probably the only thing you'll remember when the test time comes. <laughs> Everything else will just glitter away and be like, oh, I know, at least I know what Iron Maiden's mascot's name is, which will not be on the test. I'm sorry to tell you. And it actually is Eddie. Um, not named after Eddie Van Halen, as far as I know, but yes, it is, his name is Eddie. Uh, Judas is from what? What other metal band? Judas Priest. Yep, Judas Priest. Uh, Lemmy is from? Motorhead, yeah, let me was a bass player from Motorhead. Uh, and then Ozzy, obviously. Ozzy Osbourne, yeah, the, the one, the only. All right. Just so you know, if anyone ever tossed a bat up to me, can't say what I would do in that situation, but probably not going to bite its head off. So just, just FYI, if anyone's familiar with that. You guys are too young for that, but that's okay. Go look it up. Okay, uh, which medication is indicated for a DVT in the post-operative period after a hip replacement? So a person comes out of surgeries, no one remembered to put them on any kind of DVT prophylaxis. They didn't have their SCDs on, they weren't ambulating, all of a sudden they get a DVT. What are we going to use for them? Yeah. 
correct. Anoxaparin is correct. So why would warfarin not be correct? It takes too long to kick in, right? It's going to take several days before that actually starts to deplete this clotting factor. So it's not going to be a good option for that. Uh, how about TPA? Why not that? Right, so again, this, this becomes kind of a risk-benefit sort of analysis. So yes, you're right, uh, absolute bleeding is the biggest risk whenever giving TPA. So for a DVT, is that immediately life-threatening? No, but however, they had a massive PE that, you know, that got dislodged and had a massive PE and they're coding, and then you're gonna have to start to consider things, right? So you may be like, well, patient's gonna die if I don't do anything, or they might bleed if I give them the TPA, which they could potentially die from. You got usually are on the side of giving the TP. Again, you have to look at the 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 type of surgery. You know, uh, you have to go through the contraindications. But that is going to be more for like a life threatening like PE sort of uh, situation, not for just a, a DVT. Then aspirin, not really going to be potent enough. Only going to be an anti platelet agent. Not going to be good enough in this case. However, sub Q noxaparin is going to be our drug of choice in, in most cases, right? Uh, alternatively, we could have used um, heparin itself, you know, unfractionated heparin. How would you administer that? Do you think? IV, yep, usually as a continuous infusion, right? Because again, you can use unfractionated heparin sub-Q like three times a day for a pro, uh, prophylaxis of a clot. However, for treatment, though, you have to do that continuous infusion. Um, how would you monitor for the anticoagulant effects of an oxaparin? Yeah, you need an anti-10A level for that one. However, with heparin, what could you do? APTT, yep. How about warfarin? All right, how about aspirin? Yeah, there's no monitoring for that one. Um, how about Altaplace? You yeah, should be monitoring kind of for everything at that point, because again, it's such a potent uh, anticoagulant kind of monitor for most of the clotting uh, studies at that point. Um, but you also look for things like thrombin time and other things you don't see too too frequently. But um, okay, so uh, but actually, this question could be updated because again, I'll probably update this more as more studies are being done. But a lot of the newer oral anticoagulants. As I mentioned before, are starting to be used in, in place of things like anoxaparin, where you can use things like apixaban or rivaroxaban, and you just start patients on that orally as a, as a treatment. So they're starting to find some uh, equally efficacious uh, effects there. Did the uh, platelet function test um, They may have some effects, but not something we routinely monitor for. Yeah, so it's not like we do any kind of tests to see. You can monitor aspirin levels specifically, right? Um, but you, we don't normally look to any kind of platelet functions to look at um, specifically if they're having an aspirin effect on board or not. Good question though. All right, up next. Which of the following is true regarding medical marijuana? Short-term memory loss is a potential side effect. Oral administration is the fastest onset. Weight loss is a common side effect or it may only be prescribed for indications supported by randomized controlled trials. So RCT stands for. Because you're going to get the question. Patients are going to come up and like, hey, stub my toe. Can I get some of that medical marijuana? Interesting, interesting. Yes. So, um, wh why is uh, the yellow option incorrect? It may only be prescribed for indications supported by randomized controlled trials. We don't really have those trials to support that. A lot of things we have are like random, uh, um, uh, cohort studies and you know, case control studies, things like that. Um, it's harder to do a lot of randomized controlled trials, uh, especially head-to-head -head trials with, with medical marijuana. So uh, that is not mandated. In fact, um, do you need to have any specific evidence to show that it has effect? No, they kind of, especially in the Florida law, they gave you that out, right? They had things that we know has uh, evidence for use, like, you know, uh, chemo-induced nausea, vomiting, ALS, um, or some other, like, uh, indications. Anorexia. Hmm? Anorexia. Was that what you yeah, so even like, you know, autoimmune conditions like Crohn's, lupus, I think it was on that list too. Um, but they, yeah, they give that little caveat at the end there, said if the provider feels like the risk versus benefit analysis, you know, would, would you know, indicate they may benefit from this, you can go ahead and go for it, right? Um, so you don't need a plethora of good studies that said that, yes, you may use this. Again, it can be very dependent on your patient and, and kind of what you're evaluating its potential benefits there. 
Um, oral administration is the fastest onset. Why is that incorrect? Right, so versus other routes, because again, the other most popular route of administration is inhaling, right? So uh, inhaling uh, is much, much faster, right? Because it gets absorbed very quickly from the lungs and can then be delivered right to the CNS very quickly. Um, however, with oral administration, you have to get through the GI tract, has to go through first pass effect, has to go through all that stuff. It takes a lot longer. And again, remember I talked about that dose stacking that some people will experience where they will have a, a you know, they'll consume it orally. They don't feel any effects after 30 minutes and so they say, okay, well, let me try another dose, 30 minutes, try another dose. And then all of a sudden they are way higher than they ever expected to be. Um, so you can be really careful with that dose stacking. Uh, how about the weight loss as a common side effect? No, we use it as an appetite uh, stimulant, right? So if anything, you know, uh, you expect to see a little bit of weight gain uh, for especially those end-stage, you know, uh, age patients and, and cancer patients. You expect to have some good appetite uh, stimulation there, and they can actually put on some weight. However, short-term memory loss is certainly a potential side effect, so do be aware of that and educate your patients. Okay. Which medication for rheumatoid arthritis works by inhibiting the Janus kinase proteins? Those tyrosine kinase receptors, they're activated by interleukin-6 and you know, those jack proteins and when cause a bunch of transcription of inflammatory mediators. I even already gave away the answer based on tyrosine kinase receptors. And so there's a certain naming convention for drugs that affect tyrosine kinase receptors. If you go back to your cancer lectures, you'll notice this. Yes, tofacitinib is the correct answer. What part of the name gives it away? The ib at the end, right? So remember, if you go back and remember imatinib, um, erlotinib, those are all going to be drugs that affect the tyrosine kinase receptor. So this is no, um, uh, no deviation from that. Uh, how does the tanner stuff work? Yeah, it's TNF alpha. Uh, it'll bind up TNF alpha, right? So similar to something like uh, infliximab, right? Uh, Adalimumab, all the TNF alpha inhibitors. What about methotrexate? Folic acid antagonist, right? How about tocilizumab? Interleukin six, right? So it's an IL six. Uh, uh, will bind up interleukin six. Now, for rheumatoid arthritis, if I were to combine any of these medications together, what would, uh, which ones would you not want to combine together? So you wouldn't want to uh, mix a tanner step less tocilizumab? Why not? You don't want to do two by a lot. Even though they have complementary mechanisms, right? One's going against IL-6, one's going against TNF-alpha. Um, you worry about the immunosuppression being just kind of too overwhelming. You don't want to do that. You don't want to mix the biologics. However, could you use methotrexate plus a tanner step? Yeah. Yep. Could I use methotrexate plus tocilizumab? Yeah. Yes. How about tofacitinib plus one of these biologics? I actually don't recommend that either, right? Because again, these are very potent. Uh, this is a very potent uh, immunosuppressant. You don't want to uh, mix those. Um, I don't know quite as much how often they're mixing methotrexate plus tofacitinib, but that could be a, a, an option as well. But again, usually methotrexate is a good starting out medication, and then you can add on things as you go forward. I Leflunamide plus these other biologics? Yeah, you can certainly use that. It's no problem. Yeah, so again, it's just um, not mixing two biologics, but certainly non-biologic plus a biologic is totally fine. And also multiple non-biologics are okay too. So like you did methotrexate plus, you know, leflunamide. Because again, before we had biologics, that's all we had, and that's kind of what we did, right? Make sense? Okay. All right. Uh, which of the following have the potential to cause physical dependence and addiction? See a lot of scared looks, right? That's what I think it is. Could this be a trick question? I don't know. They're all correct. Any opioid can cause physical dependence and addiction. 
it's all a matter of the dose and the chronicity. Mm -hmm. Any of them can do it. So that's the point with that one. Um, certainly morphine, you think morphine addiction? Yes, certainly that can do that. However, what does codeine get turned into? Morphine, morphine right? So that has that, that same risk. Tramadol. Tramadol used to be non-controlled substance, right? However, we saw a lot of abuse seen with it because, again, it was non-controlled, easy to get a hold of, especially in big doses. People still abuse it, and they still had some addiction with it because, again, it's a partial opioid agonist. So, again, the same thing's going to happen there. And then methadone, what do we use methadone for usually? Used to treat opioid addiction. However, people can get hooked on this just as much as they can on anything else, okay? Any opioid can do this, right? Okay. I think that's the only trick question I had on there. All right, diabetic patient suddenly passes out, and AccuCheck shows a blood glucose of 35 milligrams per deciliter. How do you proceed? Is that low? Mm -hmm. Pretty low. What do you consider hypoglycemia? Less than 70, less than 65. So I want to give them four units of regular insulin. Do I want to give them some glucagon, some carbohydrates? Orally, don't use metformin. What is going to correct their issue? Interesting. So the correct answer was glucagon IM. So why is it glucagon IM? The patient's passed out. You cannot give them oral medications if they are unconscious, right? So again, uh, risk for aspiration, you know, uh, if they're passed out, they're that severe, you need to give them something parenteral. So this is where glucagon can be a really good option from that standpoint. Remember a big side effect with glucagon? A lot of nausea and vomiting associated with that one, right? So you're expecting them to, to get, especially when you give them kind of a big dose like this to get them kind of get the blood sugar back, tend to have a chance to, to throw up there. So you don't want to be careful with that. Um, insulin would not be correct. Why? You kind of killed your patient. I'm sorry. So. The two of you there. Don't do that. Don't give them more insulin if their blood glucose is already 35. That'd be poor, poor, uh, poor showing. Um, how about metformin? That's just an insulin sensitizer. It really wouldn't help to correct our issue with this one. Again, it's a, an oral option, so that would not be uh, correct either. Certainly, if uh, remember that, that rule of 15s, if you had a patient who is experiencing hypoglycemia but they're still conscious, that would be a decent option. You do 15 grams of carbohydrates. You recheck them in how long? 15 minutes, and you look to see kind of where they're at, and you can repeat as necessary. Because, again, a lot of people tend to overcorrect on this, so kind of just consume a ton of carbohydrates, and then all of a sudden they're hyperglycemic, and you're kind of fighting yourself. Kind of, they get on this, um, this kind of roller coaster of, of blood glucose. So we want to avoid that. We want to try to get them up kind of safely, but quickly. All right. What else could I use besides a glu uh, glucagon? IV dextrose, right? So you can always give IV dextrose uh, as, a, as a backup there. Um and remember, we have lots of different concentrations. But remember, D50 is probably the most common one used for adults. However, for kids, you want to skew something less concentrated. D10, D25 is going to be a better option for them. Right. All right. A patient with no insurance and occasional GERD symptoms would most benefit from which agent? Sure. So, uh, at which point would you use the dextrose? Like, if you're thinking that perhaps they had depleted all their glycogen stores. Um, if I had heard that they've been found down for an unknown period of time, um, again, if they are out of those glycogen stores, you're not wrong to give glucagon because again, there's no way to really quantify that. You just may not see a whole lot of effect from it. So again, if you're like you know first responders show up, they see they're hypoglycemic. That's a very quick, easy thing to give is is give the glucagon, right? Um, However, the really definitive thing is going to be the dextrose. So if they're not responding well to the glucagon, then you can certainly use the dextrose. However, if we, you know, for instance, if we have a kid over in the ER who's hypoglycemic, um, you know, they're, they're low, they're not like, you know, unconscious, like, you know, in that case, um, you know, we'll give them some IV dextrose. We don't necessarily want to jump to glucagon right away because, again, that side effect associated with the nausea vomiting, more expensive as well because that's to be recombinantly made. Um, because, again, it's a natural hormone that we, we produce anyway. So um, dextrose, usually err on the side of giving that if you can, but uh, glucagon is good for kind of quick reversals. Um, all right, okay, so why calcium carbonate? Cheap, 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 right? It's like a bird. Um, why not polyethylene glycol? 
Uh, it's used for constipation. It's not going to help with GERD symptoms of anything, right? Uh, how about Rebeprazole? Yeah, it's going to be prescription. It's going to be a lot more expensive, typically. So again, may not be the best option for that patient. How about Misoprostol? What do we use that for? So you can use it to induce abortions, right? That's one thing. But the other thing we most likely use it for, from a GI standpoint, Stimulate, so it acts as a prostate gland, so it stimulates production of that mucus barrier, right? So it helps us uh, to heal the stomach or to protect the stomach in cases where you're combining it with what? Usually NSAIDs, right? So again, that's why you see that combination like that clofenac plus misoprostol can be utilized. Um, you know, so that's, that's where it's going to be having the most benefit from that same one. Again, not going to be good for GERD symptoms. All right. Which of the following NSAIDs is preferred in a patient with a history of GI ulcer? Had this high risk GI history, what do you think would be best for them? Because the one go to option you would think of is not on there. What would that be? Celebrex. Celebrex, yes, Celecoxib would be the one. Why would you go with that one? COX2 inhibitor. COX2 inhibitor, absolutely. Okay, so which one of these thereby are going to have some COX2 inhibition? Some preference for COX2 inhibition, right? Because again, selectivity is all relative. <laughs> Correct. Meloxicam or Mobic is a little bit more selective for COX-2. It might be a better option for a patient with a history of GI ulcer. Um, ibuprofen, non-selective. That would not be a good option. How about uh, naproxen? Non-selective. Toradol, non-selective. Right. So again, remember, there's just a few of those that have COX-2 selectivity. Celebrex certainly being the most selective. That would have been an even better option in this kind of case. Uh, but meloxicam could be used as well. Okay. Okay. A uh, diabetic patient develops a fungal UTI. Which medication likely caused this? Just have mushrooms popping out of the urethra. Let me say, there's a likely cause for this. Let me say, I always knew he was a fun guy. <laughs> Steals it. Yes. A bicycle does a dachshund ride. A bicycle does a dachshund ride. Don't know. Doxycycline. Doxycycline. That's pretty good. Why was the bicycle so lazy? He was too tired. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I guess uh, so. Something like paroxicam might be a better option. Uh, it kind of fits in that same category as like meloxicam. They tend to have a little bit more cox selectivity, right? So in, I would say intermediate versus like Celebrex would kind of be on like the most selective that we have. Like uh, certain paroxicam, meloxicam, kind of have the uh, kind of the intermediate kind of setting there. Yep. Um, all right. So this is going to be canagliflozin. Which again doesn't sound very uh, doesn't sound very sexy of a drug name. So we have Invokana. So that would be correct, right? Do you remember how that drug worked? Pee out your sugar, right? It's the SGL uh, S. What is it? Sodium glucose. What's the L for? I don't remember. Anyway, SGLT uh, two inhibitor, right? So again, it's inhibiting that transporter protein. You're blocking the reuptake of glucose. So you're gonna pee it all out, and then the fungus kind of finds out and says, "Hey, this looks really good," and we start munching down, and then they they make an infection, right? So, um, how about xenotide? What does that do? What kind of drug is that? Remember what animal it comes from? Remember the Gila monster, right? So that's a GLP-1 agonist, right? So again, it's an incretin mimetic is another name for those. Uh, similarly, what other one has that same uh, mechanism? <coughs> the loraglutide, right? That fits in the same category as those incretin mimetics. And then certainly insulin detamir is insulin, so that would not uh, cause that in this case. All right. Uh, which medication can be used to treat hypo and hyperthyroidism? I asked my wife because we were in school at the same time. We both went to pharmacy school at the same time. And so I was like, oh, remember that lecture where we had the guy tell us all about the, the radioactive blast and how he'd have the iodine you had to take? And she's like, yeah, I think I remember that. And I said, I was trying to tell it to the students. They didn't seem all that too impressed. She's like, yeah, I wasn't either when I heard it. So why'd you tell them that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was trying to help them remember stuff. Huh? 
<laughs> uh, they do, sometimes. My little one, though, she doesn't know anything. She's just like, ah, food, sleep, food, sleep, poop. That's it. All right, iodine. Yes, iodine in the right doses can stimulate thyroid hormone production. However, in too high of a dose, you can actually suppress thyroid uh, uh, hormone production. Right. So it kind of is a double-edged sword there. It's all about the dose in that case. How about levothyroxine? What is that used for? Hypothyroidism, right? Because that is basically what? T4, right? It's T4. So that's going to be, is that the more active form? No, T3 is a more active form, right? So it gets, takes time to get converted over. But that is going to be used for hypothyroidism. How about uh, PTU? That's for hyperthyroidism. Similarly, methimazole is also used for hyperthyroidism. Those help to prevent production of new thyroid hormone, right? So it's better for thyrotoxicosis, thyroid storm, things like that. All right. Uh, how should the dose of hydrocortisone change when a person with Addison's disease becomes stressed? Say they have a farm test coming up in three days. Or it's Sunday night and they realize they haven't studied for the farm test. Absolutely. So it needs to increase, right? Because what would our normal adrenal glands do in this situation? Increase production, right? It would increase cortisol production. We're stressed out. Um, so it would not be to decrease. And so this is important because you have to have uh, dosing instructions for these patients to say, like, hey, if you're, you know, if you get become ill, if you get in these kind of stress situations, like you need to increase your dose by a certain amount, whether it be 10 milligrams or 20 milligrams, whatever it happens to be. Because remember, hydrocortisone is just what? cortisol, right? So what we naturally produce anyway. So most of these patients will be on hydrocortisone kind of uh, chronically uh, to replace this. So um, what would switching to fludrocortisone do for us? It's a, it's a mineralocorticoid primary. So they may actually be on hydrocortisone plus uh, fludrocortisone, but that's mainly going to help with uh, um, their, their blood volume status, right? It's going to help to maintain their blood pressure. Um, so they'll usually be on both of these together. Um, in some cases, uh, if you have someone who's coming in like really adrenal crisis, you know, severe adrenal suppression, um, we'll just give them enough hydrocortisone to kind of replace a lot of that. You don't have to necessarily su uh, supplement with more fluid cortisone. It's more of a kind of a chronic medication they'll be on typically. Good. All right. Diabetes in the lead. Uh, which medication is used to stimulate ovulation in women with hyperprolactinemia? There's a balance between prolactin and what other... Dopamine, right? Prolactin and dopamine. What could I get? I give oxandrolone, fludrocortisone, finasteride, or bromocryptine. Yes, bromocryptine is the correct answer because bromocryptine is what? Hmm? It's a dopamine agonist, right? So, yeah, so by activating dopamine receptors, uh, you'll cause a seesaw to kind of uh, shift again, and you'll kind of uh, let up on that prolactin levels, right? Those, they should diminish when you have uh, dopamine agonism. Similar to the, or conversely to the uh, first-generation antipsychotics, when you block dopamine receptors, what happens to prolactin levels? They go up, right? So, again, uh, keep that seesaw effect kind of in mind. That's how we can treat that. Uh, what do you use finasteride for? Yeah, so, so it's a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, so it prevents production of DHT. So that would be better for patients like with BPH, something like that. Uh, we talked about fludrocortisone already. What's oxandrolone? It's going to be like a uh, testosterone replacement, right? So it's going to be uh, an analog to testosterone you can administer. Um, that one is an oral option. What's the problem with oral the administered testosterone? Hydrotoxicity is a big thing, right? So again, a lot of patients will utilize transdermal or injectable forms of testosterone. If you give that orally, you do have to watch their uh, liver function test, right? All right. Which of the following insulins would be best to correct postprandial hyperglycemia? No, I spelled Degladec wrong, but that's okay. You have Lispro, Degladec. NPH insulin, glargine, what do I give?
Correct. So insulin list pro or Humalog. The way I remember this, and I don't know if this will work for everyone, but I think like Humalog, I think logarithmic, I think very kind of rapidly increasing numbers. I think very fast acting. That's the way I kind of think about it. I don't know if it works for you guys or not, but uh, Humalog would be a good option here. What else could we have used? There's Novalog, which is insulin aspart. And then there's another one. There's that uh, Pedro, which is insulin glulosine. Those are the three really rapid acting ones. You could also use regular insulin. So if you saw like Humulin R or Novalin R, those would be fine too, but they're not going to have as rapid of an onset as the, the newer, uh, shorter acting ones like Humulog, Novalog, things like that. Um, how about these other ones? How about insulin Degladec? How long does that last for? Long time. It's like a once daily sort of uh, insulin. So again, not good for quick corrections of glucose, right? If you want to have quick, quick corrections of things, you need a short acting fast acting medication, right? Um, insulin glargine, another, yeah, pretty long acting. And then NPH insulin is going to be more kind of intermediate to long acting. So again, that's probably like a twice daily sort of insulin. Um, not going to be good for postprandial uh, glucose correction. Yes, sir. Which effect? Yes, um, that one's always hard to bring back up in my mind. I always have a tough time with that. So um, one of the problems you run into with some of these patients is they'll wake up. Uh, they'll have, either have like a, a period overnight where they're having a hypoglycemia or they could have like a hyperglycemia thing, sort of thing. Um, with that, you typically correct with um, by adjusting their uh, evening dose. So, um, for instance, you can give them like a long acting that will kind of take them throughout the night. So if they, you know, so you can have, you can instruct them to kind of wake up in the middle of the night at 2 or 3 a.m., check their glucose, and if it's high, that means they're not getting enough insulin coverage overnight. So you could actually supplement with a long-acting form to kind of carry them through the night. So it may require something like a twice-daily, you know, um, insulin glargine or something like that. Is that what you're referencing? Yeah, like if you said that they have to be so active, Well, you could do that, but then you're having to have them wake up every night to, to correct it, right? Okay. So instead, if I can give them something long-acting to where they can take it before bedtime, then they're covered regardless. Okay. You know what makes sense? And then sometimes you'll have where they'll kind of um, have a period where they kind of wake up hypoglycemic and you, or I'm sorry, they wake up hyperglycemic. And some of that is related to like a stress um, issue to where if they became hypoglycemic at night, cause they had too much insulin on board, then their body's trying to react to that by having a lot of glucagon being secreted and things like that. It could be a, an issue of having too much insulin on board over the nighttime period. So it gets a little bit more complicated, but I think it's basically what you're talking about there though. Right. All right. Uh, which agent can be used as a prokinetic in a patient with gastroparesis? Sodium bicarb, isomeprazole, metoclopramide, cannabis sativa. What's the main actual component in cannabis? THC. It's also CBD, which has some roles as well. Remember the name of the synthetic THC that we have to use for like, you know, chemotherapy related nausea vomiting? Dronabinol, yep. It's also nabolone. I didn't cover too much, but uh, dronabinol is probably the more common one we see being used. <clears throat> I remember when I was in uh, pharmacy school when I was interning at a hospital and I was having to do uh, NARC. Uh, vault reconciliation. So basically kind of going through, make sure all their counts are right for everything. Uh, and I was looking at this drug and I was like, Dronabinol, what the heck is this? And I looked it up and I was like, oh, this is like synthetic weed, man. It was kind of blew my mind a little bit. I was like, we give people weed? What? Like, kind of odd. Anywho. So, um, sodium bicarb. What do we use that for? Antacid, right? Not going to be good for gastroparesis. How about cannabis? Not really a prokinetic agent. It certainly is an appetite stimulant, but it's not going to help to propulse things along through the GI tract. Not a good option. Isomeprazole. PPI, right? It's going to be good for acid suppression. Not good for prokinetic function. Metoclopramide. Yeah, yeah antidopaminergic also has some uh, activity to stimulate uh, the GI tract. You'll get some uh, increase in peristalsis with that. What else could you have used in that case? Yeah, erythromycin is the other one. That kind of stimulates those modal interceptors in the GI tract, right? So and when you think of erythromycin, you see a lot of diarrhea associated with it. It makes sense based on the prokinetic features of it, right? So again, the, either two of those would have been good options for, for this case. All right. What can be given to patients when receiving infliximab to prevent infusion reactions? 
Remember the chimeric protein, right? It has a little, some mouse protein in there. Should put cheese on here as an option. That would have been kind of funny. Only to me, but. Can I give them? Can I give them some adalimumab, some methotrexate, some epinephrine, diphenhydramine? Perfect. Okay, so Humira would not be correct, right? Because why? Yeah, they're both ENF. We really wouldn't do anything for the infusion reactions there. Methotrexate, similarly, would not do anything for our, our reactions. Um, however, Benadryl, right? So again, when you're having, and again, it, the point of this, when I was trying to uh, make with this, is that uh, there's a difference between having like a true full-blown anaphylaxis and then just having infusion reactions, right? They're mediated through the same principles. Uh, you're getting uh, an allergic anaphylactoid sort of reaction here, but it's not full-blown anaphylaxis. Things like Benadryl can be really good for this. You could similarly do um, steroids that can help with this as well, like a methylprednisolone or hydrocortisone. However, when do you use epinephrine? Actual true full-blown anaphylaxis. You'll have PRN orders for epinephrine, but it's important to realize um, that you need to have that as a, like a PRN on-call sort of drug available at the bedside, but not to be administered unless they actually have true anaphylaxis. This is actually had a, um, a potential error that we caught because um, we had an infusion center kids. We had a nephrologist who was writing for uh, rituximab. You guys remember rituximab? I mentioned that one briefly. The CD20 uh, targeting uh, antibody. That one again also has a big risk for having um, um, for having anaphylaxis to it because again it's a chimeric protein. Uh, and we're using it for I, I don't know if, uh, they're having some sort of nephritis. That's kind of a chronic issue for them, so they're getting rituximab uh, for that. And so the orders came across, and something had happened to it because usually we have these order sets that are made up. They kind of have everything kind of pre-done for you, so you just click the boxes on what you want and you're done. Something got screwed up here to where they actually had uh, the epinephrine came across as uh, once instead of once PRN, right? So when you say once, what do you think that means to the nurse who's looking at the, the order? It means go ahead and give it, right? It says you want that one time, so go ahead and give it now, right? Similarly, they had uh, another order for like the, the steroids. And again, this patient was getting a big dose of like methylprednisolone and rituximab, and then they had a, what should have been a PRN order for, for hydrocortisone in case they had an anaphylaxis. So that one came across as once as well. So I called the doc, and I was like, hey, you didn't actually want to give them epinephrine unless they had a reaction, right? And she's like, yeah, of course. So, my, you know, so sorry. Uh, so I went ahead and corrected that. And, and again, the nurses probably would have caught that, and it would have been like, well, this is obviously it's wrong. However, you know, it's one of those things where you don't want to have any of those. Uh, the, you guys are familiar with the Swiss cheese model for medication errors, right? Mm -hmm. And all the holes kind of line up. So that was one hole we were trying to get rid of. So that way um, that uh, the error wouldn't have happened because um, you don't want to give someone epinephrine who doesn't really need it. Bad news. Okay. A person with acute pain after a dental procedure would most benefit from which medication? <clears throat> Uh, fentanyl patch, transdermal, heroin IV, oxycodone extended release, Lortab PO. Did I tell you guys about my heroin addiction? Uh, for a long time, I, I, I kicked the habit now, but I was addicted to, to women who saved the world. Um, it was a bad habit. Wonder Woman was a tough, tough movie for me. Hmm? Yeah, the crickets for that one. <laughs> Good, no one gave them heroin IV. That would be, <laughs> while effective, also highly illegal. We should not do that. Um, what schedule is heroin? Is it schedule zero? There's no, I guess a schedule zero would be like no regulations on it. Schedule one, right? There's no acceptable medical use for heroin. Lots of good opioids. If you have on other schedules, we don't need heroin, right? Um, fentanyl patch, why would that be incorrect? It takes a while, like, you know, over 24 hours for it to really start to kick in. So if I'm having an acute dental pain right now, not going to be a good option for me. Similarly, why not oxycodone extended release? 
too long acting. I mean, certainly it could it could work, but it's not really going to be good for those kind of acute bouts of pain. This is more uh, suited for chronic pain patients, chronic low back pain, chronic whatever pain. Um, that, that's going to be better for the long acting forms. Or having kind of baseline pain throughout the day. This is for someone who's going to have just really kind of intermittent pain. Otherwise, you're going to kind of over medicate them and, and see side effects. That's no good. Um, hydrocodone, acetaminophen, Lortab, PO. Great option, right? Short acting medication. Um, you can use it, you know, as needed every four to six hours for pain. Perfect way to write that. Uh, and then they can administer it as, as needed, right? Um, short acting, not going to last all day. Less likely to see those kind of side effects. Okay, what is the max allowable acetaminophen in a day for a patient receiving lower tab? Down the wire. Yes. Okay. So the right answer here is going to be four thousand milligrams, otherwise known as four grams. Right. So four grams in a day. It really should be the max you would recommend to a patient. You may see some labeling that will recommend thirty to fifty. That's more for like patients who are self-medicating, buying it over the counter. Um, and then who else might benefit from having a max of thirty to fifty? Yeah, they have a history of liver disease, anything like that. That would be something you want to to recommend a lower dose for them because you're more likely to see damage being done with that. Um, again, any you know, of these uh, two are correct. Uh, One point two or 1,200 micrograms is equal to 1.2 milligrams. That's like a homeopathic dose. That would be right. Yeah, there's 500 micrograms. So. All right, good. Watch your units. Always watch your units. You can really go go wrong, especially when you're mixing opioids and going from fentanyl micrograms to dilated in milligrams, and, and you know, so you gotta be careful of those things. All right. Which of the following is the best initial treatment for type one diabetes? I just saw that debt in here. That was pretty good. Pretty good pun there. For being in a private school. It was D E B T in here. For anybody didn't catch it. <coughs> Got some of y'all. So what's the key thing here? Type one. Type one diabetic patient, right? So do they have any insulin that they're producing themselves? No, no right? So what do we replace it with? Insulin. insulin. That is the treatment of choice. Rare instances you might see someone who has uh, type one diabetes and they, you know, have really kind of poor diet and things like that, where they have some degree of insulin resistance. They may benefit from metformin. Typically, though, when you think of like a type one diabetic patient, like how what's their body type usually? usually pretty thin for the most part, you'd, you'd expect to see, right? Because again, they're having a hard time, they don't have enough insulin, they're not really, they have weight losses associated with that, right? Um, rosy glitazone, also not a good option for, uh, we wouldn't use that first line for type one or type two, right? It's usually gonna be an add-on. In fact, that was the one we saw some increased risk for cardiovascular death, so there's some concerns with using that. Um, metformin though, who would that be good for? Most type two diabetic patients, who would it not be good for? From a type two diabetes standpoint, who would, who would be uh, not a good candidate? Liver disease, renal disease, right? You have too much uh, renal dysfunction, you're gonna hold on to that, uh, that metformin. What can you see? It's the big, potentially deadly side effect of metformin. Lactic acidosis, right? You gotta be really careful of that uh, in patients with renal dysfunction, okay? Uh, a carbose, who would that be uh, good for? Potentially like a pregnant patient, you can maybe think of that. Like, you know, so again, that's the one that was an alpha glucosidase inhibitor, didn't really get absorbed. Um, so it could, you know, limit systemic effects of drugs on, on a pregnant patient. But, you know, what's a big side effect with that medication? A lot of gas associated, with a lot of abdominal cramping, because, again, all those extra carbohydrates, uh, they're going to get broken down by the gut bacteria and produce a lot of gas. 
All right. Name this member of the band Kiss. This should be pretty easy. Anyone know what Kiss stands for? Knights in Satan's service. And that's what uh, a lot of people were saying back in the 70s. And they thought Kiss was turning their kids into Satan worshipers. Correct, that is Gene Simmons. Who's Alice Cooper? What band is he in? Alice Cooper. Very strange. He gave himself that name. It's also the name of the band. Uh, Ozzy Osbourne was in Black Sabbath. And then you know, later had a very strong solo career. And then how about Ronnie James Dio? Holy Diver. Yes, that was one of his. In the band, Dio. So a little narcissistic, but there you go. All right. Which agent would not be used in the treatment of H. pylori infection? Type in H. pylori and I found this cartoon. Correct. All right. So alginic acid or gaviscon, not normally used for treatment of H. pylori. What are the typical components of an H. pylori regimen? Clarithromycin is a good one. Amoxicillin. PPI. Okay. So good. So we have two antibiotics and a PPI. What else could I add in addition to that? Bismuth, right? So your Pepto-Bismol, add on to that. It would be your four drug regimen. What other antibiotics could I use? Metronidazole. Tetracycline, those are kind of the big ones you think of, right? So it depends on resistance patterns and whatnot. But again, think of the what goes into the three versus four drug regimen. Um, Gaviscon, not going to be super great for that. Uh, better for like, you know, kind of occasional GERD type symptoms, right? Good. I have a question. Oh, that was it. Okay. Yes, sir. Did, recently, did uh, the treatment for C. diff change? Yes. Uh, good. So treatment for C. diff. So that's a good topic. I don't, uh, don't cover it specifically in the GI lecture, but maybe that's a good thing to add in for next time. It would be good feedback. Um, so what was the original treatment for C. diff? Flagyl. So metronidazole is always a good option. How would you give the flagyl? It's a, it's a, a GI infection, right? Yep. You could give it PO, but you could also give it IV. You still saw, even with IV administration, you can, this is more for severe uh, C. diff infections. You ended up having um, good good uh, tissue penetration with, with metronidazole, even if you gave it IV, so that was fine. Uh, a backup drug would be vancomycin, right? So vancomycin, remember we use that for what type of infections? MRSA, gram-positive infections primarily, right? So vanco, though, you, uh, if you give it IV, it does not work for C. diff infections because it actually doesn't have any kind of penetration. Uh, you don't want to see any appreciable levels in the GI tract. You have to give it orally. So the only time you should ever see oral vancomycin the vancomycin is a very large molecule, does not get absorbed very well, should be for C. diff infection. Okay, if so for anything else, it's, it's incorrect, okay? There's another drug called fidaxomycin, uh, which is a newer antibiotic, which is uh, primarily uh, given orally, only going to be for C. diff infections, for the only use for, uh, for that one. So the question is, well, did the guidelines recently change? Yes, that is true. We're starting to see more resistance in C. diff. So before, you used to always go with flagell as your first line option. Vanco is a backup. Um, you know, sometimes you see the combination. So I've had some really severe cases where... Um, and where I saw this most frequently is when uh, I was rotating in a pediatric intensive care unit. We had a lot of um, hemonc patients who were severely immunosuppressed, you know, due to all their um, all their chemo that they were receiving. Uh, and then they would end up getting antibiotics, you know, for the individual infections they would have. And then uh, when you give antibiotics, what's a possible outcome from that? C. diff, right? Because, again, you kind of wipe out normal gut flora. C. diff can then kind of take its place and, and cause an infection. So, um that is, is where I saw a lot of that. We would use uh, IV metronidazole plus oral vancomycin, but you couldn't switch that, right? Because you can't use IV vancomycin uh, for, for that. So um, 
the thing that changed, and for the most part, it looked like kids was still the same. It looks like you still use Flagyl for first line for uh, pediatric patients. However, for adults, they were recommending switching over and using oral vancomycin as a first line or fedaxomycin. They're seeing too high resistance pattern for Flagyl, kind of backing off of that a little bit. Okay. I don't know what other way you could use to treat C. diff. Fecal transplants. So you get people that live in the same household who should probably have a similar gut biome, uh, and you could uh, do that fecal transplant. Always sounds disgusting, but yeah, see a lot of like, no, no. Hmm? <laughs> what do you say? Um, they uh, do it with a spoon, and the, no. <laughs> no, I believe it's rectally administered. Uh, actually, I don't know. I haven't looked that uh, too much into. I just hear fecal transplant. And I'm just like, all right, that's. I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm done. They like uh, they do a colonoscopy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, so that way the patient's not having to actually be exposed to it. It just goes directly to the gut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other way was pretty crappy, so we didn't. Yeah. Okay. Anywho, all right, so we have our, our winner here, Det Amir. Who's that? If you don't mind. That's good job, good job. TB. Almost knocked you out. Very nice, very nice. Kevin's laugh. <laughs> Seems derogatory, but okay. Congratulations, your free answer is... D. Hmm. Uh, okay, so any questions for the test? This is on Monday. Make sure you get your assignments turned in. Remember, you have three prescriptions to write, so make sure that's in. Um, try to make sure, uh, try to zoom in on the picture when you uh, uh, before you submit it. If I can't, if the resolution's low enough, and I can't really zoom in to read it well. I'll have to ask you to re resubmit it. So just try to make sure you zoom in quick and just make sure it's readable. Uh, other than that, uh, I will see you guys uh, next time. Thank you.